Welcome to the North American Martyrs for our speaker series, How the Church Changed the World. And I chose this topic uh, in part uh, because of the season. You know, November is almost like a liturgical season in itself with All Saints Day. You know, that's definitely how the church changed lives, changed sinners into saints. But then also there was Veterans Day. Of remembering all those who have changed the world in some of the most tragic world-changing events. But then it always ends with the Feast of Christ the King. That's this weekend. And so I thought to open in prayer, I would take uh, the collect from Christ the King, that prayer in the Mass, which uh, really gives us our theme for tonight. So let us begin by bowing our heads in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty, ever-living God, whose will is to restore all things in your beloved Son, the King of the universe, grant, we pray, that the whole creation set free from slavery may render your majesty service and cease it ceaselessly proclaim your praise through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So what it said there, that the whole of creation could be restored in Christ. So that brings us to our first slide on Christ the King. Uh, Christ there it is. That, the music we were listening to was from At Ephesus. If you need any good just Catholic music playing in the background. Ephesus is a group of sisters down in Missouri who sing beautiful music. They have you know, at least joined their voices to Christ the King. Uh, but this, this prayer from the Mass also echoes exactly what we prayed in that first collect, that God will restore all things through Christ, the King of the universe, the whole of creation set free from slavery, may render your majesty's service and cease to proclaim your praise. When I talk about how the church changes the world, uh, we usually think of the world in sort of a bad sense. The world is, is evil. The world is wicked. The world is fallen. It is true. But when we speak of the world, kind of Christ, the King sense, Christ is King of the world. The world is part of God's creation, and God created all things good. Yes, it's been fallen. It's riddled with sin and death, yes. Yet it's redeemed in Christ. The church is the plan of God to redeem it. So, uh, on this next slide, it sort of shows us maybe the plan of, of tonight. is isn't so much about how did the church change the world, but how does grace change nature? God creates. He is creator of all, but he's also the redeemer of all. So, nature is sort of synonymous with the world. Grace is sort of synonymous with the church. The church is God's answer to a fallen world. Grace is God's answer to a fallen nature. Grace being God's life within it. Jesus says, John 10.10, 10, I came so that they might have life. They may have it more abundantly. So, life, yes. God created the world as a free act of love to give life to the world but so that the world could have life more abundantly. Not just this life that withers and fades because of sin and death. That's sort of the consequence of sin and death, that life fades. That you use it up, take it for yourself, but with God that life can multiply abundantly. Last eternally. So that's kind of where we're going tonight. We're really seeing throughout the history of the world how grace builds on nature. How God uses the church to give life more abundantly. So I wanted to start, actually, with a letter. Um, it's a letter known as the letter to Diognetus. Um, the person behind the letter, a little mysterious, might have been a priest, maybe even a Christian priest, definitely someone who knows the Christians and is very sympathetic to them, but writing this letter in a very unsympathetic world to the early Christians. Uh, I took some images here. These are from the catacombs. Uh, in Rome, so the earliest Christians painted these things 
as a sign of their hope, yes, in a time of persecution. You know, they faced uh, trials many times, but they still gathered together in this agape meal. Uh, they had Jesus, the good shepherd, leading them uh, through the dark valley uh, to the fresh and flowing waters. And then the hope, uh, Mary and the Christ child, even. This is like the first image of Mary and the Christ child. here. So this is the world that is being spoken to. A world that doesn't know what these Christians are. What are these Christians doing in the world? And so this is what the letter has to say. It begins, Christians are indistinguishable from every other, every other men, either by nationality, language, or custom. They do not inhabit separate cities of their own, or speak a strange dialect, or follow some outlandish way of life. Their teaching is not based upon reveries, inspired by the curiosities of men. Unlike some other people, they champion no purely human doctrine. With regard to dress, food, and manner of life in general, they follow the customs of whatever city they happen to be living in, whether it is Greek or foreign. Okay. So on the outside, Christians don't change the world. They're just part of the world like everyone else. But then, yet there is something extraordinary about their lives. They live in their own countries as though they were only passing through. They play their full role as citizens, but labor under all the disabilities of aliens. Any country can be their homeland, but for them, their homeland, wherever it may be, is a foreign country. Like others, they marry and have children, but they do not expose them. That would be abortion in our language day and age. They share their meals, but not their wives. They're not about the same sort of morality of the people around them developed in this promiscuity and this really culture of death. There's this sort of culture of life that the Christians cling to that's, that's very utterly different from the world. So in a sense, they don't, they don't live in the world at all. They're not a part of it. Uh, but then he sort of melds the two. They live in the flesh, they're not governed by the desires of the flesh. They pass their days upon earth, but they are citizens of heaven. Obedient to the laws, they yet live on a level that transcends the law. Christians love all men, but all men persecute them. Condemned because they are not understood, but they are put to death, but raised to life again. They live in poverty, but enrich many. They are totally destitute, but possess an abundance of everything. They suffer dishonor, but that is their glory. They are defamed, but vindicated. A blessing is their answer to abuse. Deference, their response to insult. For the good they do, they receive the punishment of malefactors. But even then, they rejoice as though receiving the gift of life. They are attacked by Jews as aliens. They are persecuted by Greeks. Yet no one can explain the reason for this hatred. But I love reading this because it just gives me a window into that earliest to the church, what the world thought of this, this new way broken out onto the scene. Uh, it's just so amazing to think about everything that they took on. They really lived the cross every day of their life. And I just hope someone someday can say something as nice about me that uh, I was able to answer you know, persecution with a blessing, you know, suffer dishonor, that be my glory. There's, uh, if you turn the page, maybe not, turn the page back, <laughs> because I left off right where I wanted to pick up. Maybe we're just going to read the whole thing, right? Kind of his key analogy of what the Christians are like. What's their relationship to the world? It seems like at some times they're just an ordinary part of the world. Other times it seems like they don't belong to the world at all. They're living for another life. But instead, he sort of melds the two together right here. He says, to speak in general terms, we may say the Christian is to the world what the soul is to the body. As the soul is present in every part of the body while remaining distinct from it, so Christians are found in all the cities of the world but cannot be identified with the world. As the visible body contains the invisible soul, so Christians are seen living in the world. But their religious life remains unseen. The body hates the soul and wars against it. We know what that feels like whenever we're tempted or our passions. Not because of any injury the soul has done, but because of the restriction of the soul places on its pleasure. Similarly, the world hates the Christians, not because they have done it any wrong, but because they are opposed to its enjoyments. 
Christians love those who hate them just as the soul loves the body and all its members, despite the body's hatred. It is by the soul enclosed within the body that the body is held together. And similarly, it is by the Christians, detained in the world as in a prison, the world is held together. The soul, though immortal, has a mortal dwelling place. The Christians also live for a time amidst perishable things while awaiting the freedom from change and decay that will be theirs in heaven. The soul benefits from the deprivation of food and drink, so Christians flourish under persecution. Such is the Christian's lofty and divinely appointed function from which he is not permitted to excuse himself. So that letter uh, really speaks to the vocation of the Christian in the world, to be as though the soul to the body. Uh, the soul is that which gives life to the body, gives it movement, gives it action, gives it direction, uh, gives meaning to all the different parts, it's all through the soul. So also the Christian in the world gives meaning to the world's action, gives life to the movements. Uh, without that, the body, though, can do all sorts of things, will end in destruction. So with that, we get to a little later on, we're, we're a little past the early days of the church. Now the church is, is in the limelight, as it were. The church is very visible. And we get to St. Augustine in the city of God. So there comes a question that arises at this point in human history. These Christians have emerged as, again, this soul in this body. And the body is very much suffering. So the Christians suffered at, at the start of their existence. Now they're more or less, you could say, almost in charge of the world. And the world is falling apart. It's the fall of the Roman Empire. You, you see, in the, you're on, see in the picture, if you're on uh, with us, it's, it's pretty devastating. The barbarians are at the gates. They're attacking the city. They're looting and, and pillaging. And, and people are fleeing to the countryside. It's the collapse of civilization. So St. Augustine kind of living around this time as the Roman Empire is weakening. And there's this sort of question that gets asked of Christians a lot. Well, the Christians must be bad for the world. Now, all they care about the world to come. They've neglected this world as it is now. So any change, how has the church changed the world? Well, they might say, for the worse. We're in a worse spot. The city of God is really the answer to that question where St. Augustine shows <laughs> that Christianity is actually the best thing that has happened for the Roman Empire. Uh, he'll show, we're not going to read everything uh, here, but you can sort of read these, at least these three paragraphs that have pulled out. He sort of shows that where Rome was going, it was, again, the fullness of nature. They had everything right nature-wise, but nature has fallen. And eventually... Nature, there, there's the saying, you know, God always forgives, man sometimes forgives, nature never forgives. Uh, nature always demands her payment. So, for instance, it, early on in the book, he kind of shows that everything Rome had going for it before the Christians was going to end up leading it to disaster. Uh, he says this, uh, you complain about Christianity, is it not because you just desire to enjoy all your luxurious license unrestrained. Uh, he mentions a little later on, your purpose, rather, is to run riot in an endless variety of pleasures and thus to generate from your prosperity a moral pestilence, which will prove a thousandfold more disastrous than the fiercest enemy. Because the real enemy isn't, isn't the barbarians at the gate. It isn't the Christians who have sort of raised up a more loving and caring generation. You know, it's this sort of moral pestilence you've brought upon Rome by constantly trying to live in endless pleasure, in endless lux luxury, you know, taking, 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 this attitude and this culture of taking for oneself. All that's going to do is provide a more, a thousandfold more disastrous uh, solution uh, to our city. So it's kind of turns it back on them, says, Christianity has come to, to the rescue, really. Your world is falling apart because your human desires were unchecked for so long that you build up this Tower of Babel, towers coming crashing down, and Augustine kind of 
foreshadows the church will be there to pick up the people. So he, short, he sort of shows in these other two paragraphs that I pointed out, you can read them on your own, but it sort of shows what a true city is built on. It's not built on these passions, these desires, to take, take, take. Uh, he sort of defines a people. Uh, he defines a people as, you know, all these individuals who attach themselves to the same object. And whatever that object is sort of defines the people. So if all these people attach themselves to the object of Husker football, then they are Husker football fans. They are a people set apart for Husker football. Now, the problem is the people is only as noble and they're only as enduring as the object that they choose. So if they choose Husker football, how long can they last? I don't want to answer that question. Don't answer that question, but you get the idea. The more noble the object the people chooses, the more enduring that people will last. So Rome chose an object that was inferior. They chose their own desires, their own glory, the glory of Rome as their object. That ultimately will fade. And as it fades, it sort of snowballs and collapses in on itself. It's a tower of Babel waiting to fall. So what is the only secure object? What's the only object that makes sense to build your entire civilization on that will last? Well, it's what he calls the city of God. The city of man, again, built on our own glory, will eventually fall and collapse in on itself because its object is inferior. But God, as the object of your city, it can last forever. Because your object of your love lasts forever. So let's come now into our own century, our own age. Um, you can turn to where it says, chapter 4, Gaudium et Spes, the role of the church in the modern world. That's where we pick up at. So Second Vatican Council, I know we skipped a lot of history there. We're going to go back and fill in the gaps. We're going to fill in the gaps, I promise. Uh, but just want to set this up. After a long time, the church reflects back on what is, again, the church's role in the world. Again, um, Augustine hinted at there's something the church adds to the city of man. The city of man did not have on its own. Okay? On its own, it collapses in on itself. Object is city of God, whose object is God, though, can endure for anything. So, church role in the modern world. This is sort of your homework from tonight, <laughs> to read chapter 4 of Gaudium et Spes. This document in particular in Vatican II was a document, all the other documents were sort of documents to uh, the church, you know, explaining, you know, what does the church think of, of the liturgy? What does the church think of the scriptures? You know, kind of reminding the church, know how we what we believe about all these things this document Gaudium et Spes was a letter to pretty much the whole world saying this is what we're here for but Vatican II uh, the setup to it is really after the world wars still very much on the mind of especially Europeans right that again this this nationalism and this globalization that have started up and industrialization all of man's powers are coming together seems like we're going to build this perfect world, then it all falls apart, all destroyed in utter madness of the world wars. And so in very much the same situation as St. Augustine, the Vatican II comes in saying, you know, we're here to pick up the pieces. We're here to show you the city of God is still enduring. The city of God is still strong. The city of God has answers for a world in hurts. So Gaudium et Spes means, you know, joy and hope. So it's joy and hope for a world that's living amid fear and anxiety. So just a couple things I want to highlight out of here and then uh, leave the rest for you. I'm going to start. Oh, if, you, if you want to go to paragraph 40 and sort of jump down to number 5. Number 5 of paragraph 40. Little parentheses there. I'm going to just, it, this is going to connect all the way back to St. Augustine and to that letter to Diognetus. The church is at once a visible association and a spiritual community, so both visible and invisible. 
goes forward together with humanity, as a part of the world, and experiences the same earthly lot which the world does, but she serves as a leaven and as a kind of soul for human society. So, sort of quoting all the way back to that first letter, what are Christians like for the world? They're like the soul. Or Jesus says the kingdom of God is like a woman that adds leaven to flour. That little light shining in the darkness does a whole lot to transform the whole thing. As it is to be renewed in Christ and transformed into God's family. So this next, next paragraph is really where I want to well for this part, the Vatican II, Second Vatican Council. That the earthly and the heavenly city, the city of man and the city of God, as St. Augustine put it, they, they penetrate each other. They are a part of each other. Is a fact accessible to faith alone, right? You can't see it necessarily with your own eyes. You can't see the, the city of God in the same way you can see the city of man at. It remains a mystery of human history, which sin will keep in great disarray until the splendor of God's sons is fully revealed. Pursuing the saving purpose which is proper to her, the church does not only communicate divine life to men, but in some way casts the reflected light of that life over the entire earth. And then this is where Vatican Council lays out what can the church do for the world. And speaking to the world, saying, this is what the city of God is here to do. This is kind of, kind of our mission statement. We're here to glorify God. The church spoke that, about that in the letter on the liturgy. We're here to study the word of God, to, to, to learn about Jesus, to, to know Jesus. We church talked about that in the, in the book on divine word, De Verbum. Now the church is offering a hand to the world. And this is what she says. Most of all, so shining, reflecting that divine life onto the earth, most of all, by its healing an elevating impact on the dignity of the person by the way in which it strengthens the seams of human society and imbues everyday activity of men with a deeper meaning and importance. I think it's really those three things that the church really touches the world and really has something to offer the world. The world doesn't have in itself the dignity of human persons, something that's transgressed in so many different ways in our world, something that you can see the church has actually had great success in a sense, because this is on people's minds now, the dignity of every human person. Sometimes it's almost uh, been kidnapped, you know, by the world and used to almost cause uh, acts of indignity on people, but at the same time, people are much more aware. Every person has dignity. Uh, strengthen the seams of human society. So. What can the church help with? Again, the church belongs to every nation, every people. She speaks every tongue. She interconnects everyone all across the world in a way that can't be imagined on, on kind of a social, political level. The church is already there, every place. Strengthening bonds of, of fellowship, just even among, on a human level. And what else does she do? She imbues the everyday activity of men with a deeper meaning and importance. So, a lot of things that we're going to study now in the second half of, of this study really show that aspect of the church. Taking things that, yes, humans have maybe accomplished out of their own talents, out of their own genius, God-given talents, God-given genius, of course, but the church coming in and showing really the true value of these. Not a value by which, like Rome, we take for ourselves, we live a luxurious life, life, but a value by which we enter into the story of God. That story that's going back to him. You know, all of history, beginning from him and returning to him. Uh, the church can show the, the greater meaning behind all different acts of history uh, through the way she lives. So that's what we are going to set out to do in the next portion. Um, I did include a lot of Gaudium et Spes there, but you'll be happy to know we're not reading all of that. That's your homework. Read Gaudium et Spes. Read about what the church is meant to be for the modern world. Sort of, again, that invitation to the world. See what we have to say. Because, again, we belong 
to every age, we've been through some tough things before. We have something to say about the tough things we're going through now. So really, uh, we'll pick up. We'll take just a, a short break so I can get hot chocolate. Anyone else can get hot chocolate. Yeah, we'll pick up with faith as we walk through each of these aspects by which the church has truly brought change in the world. Just a couple minutes.